So, if you're a fan of art and science, Hi, oh yeah, a quick message from me, pictured here with my laptop, um, and the embarrassment shame emoji. Why? Because I did not record the best audio in the world for this clip. Uh, sorry about that. For some reason, my microphone was not picking up certain consonants, such as S's. Uh, don't know what the issue was, but uh, look into it. And uh, But here's still a clip for you, because I thought otherwise, well, it would be a waste of a clip, right? So, um... Thanks for being with me, and see you on the other side. Uh, cheers. Take care for now. Bye. Hiya. So, welcome back. In this video, I'd like to talk about something that uh, gets a lot of traction, doesn't it? People really bring this up a lot. When you're interested in languages, people bring up the terms polyglot, linguist, and they sometimes use them the same way. But are they the same? Are they totally opposite? Or is there actually some relation? So, besides my blurry Zoom background, I've put a Venn diagram behind me, which you can hopefully see. Imagine that the green one is polyglot, and imagine that the blue one is linguist. What do they share? Where do they overlap? Okay, so polyglot. They are defined as people who learn or who speak more than say, three, four, or five languages. It depends, right? Poly means many. So it's someone who speaks many languages. What counts as many to you? When you've decided that it's many, that's a polyglot, right? Maybe for you it's, uh, oh, I don't know, 10. So, okay. Everyone who speaks fewer than 10 languages, not a polyglot. But if you decide it's three, then, you know, you speak English and, I don't know, Mandarin and Arabic, hey, you're a polyglot. So, you know, it's a fluid definition. Well, linguist. What's a linguist? So, in common parlance, a linguist might be someone who studies languages or language. But, of course, many people's, you know, in many people's minds, that's not different, right? It's, okay, you have, say, those three languages, Arabic, Mandarin, and English, um, and you are studying them because maybe one of them you speak natively and the two others you don't, right? So you've had to learn them, you've had to study them. You're studying languages. And, of course, language as a concept maybe as some sort of, you know, <laughs> ethereal, out there, platonic form, you know, that's a byproduct, right? That's something you actually study by studying languages, right? What is language? What is human speech, you know? You chip away at that by studying multiple languages. Well, that is one way to be a linguist, because, of course, many linguists started out that way, right? You had people who saw multiple languages, uh, and they said, right, some patterns going on here, and what does that tell us about something deeper? That is already the beginning of academic linguistics. There are many people today who, I don't know, study reaction times of people looking at linguistic stimuli, right? So they get something in front of them from a particular language and they react a certain way in a certain time and someone is clocking that and measuring that. And those are also, you know, psychologists of language or psycholinguists, uh, for instance. When you get to field linguistics and other such things, that gets a bit trickier, right? So, for instance, say you are going on an expedition to a field site. Now, that sounds very grandiose, right? This could actually, you can go, a field site could be anywhere. You could go to your back garden and talk with your grandmother. And that's a field site, if that's where your grandmother lives, so to speak, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm, I'm laughing because, you know, we're talking about back gardens and grandmothers, but actually it's very serious because many people do this kind of work. Um, if you speak, for instance, a minority language that's dying out, maybe your grandmother is one of the last speakers and you stepping into your back garden, you are on a scientific expedition, right? And it is no less important than traveling halfway across the world, you know, and sailings down, you know, some rapid to get to your speakers, you know. The import is the the linguistic import, right? 
It's not about the distance. Anyway, close those parentheses. So, you know, when you get to field linguistics, whether it's your back garden or the Orinoco or, uh, you know, Sahara, you're going out into the world and you are going to a community and you are presumably learning a language or you've already learned a language in order to study that language, maybe in its entirety or maybe pick apart some pieces of it. Say, oh, I'm looking at type of verb or, you know, loan words from, you know, in a contact situation between language X and language Y, um, you know, or some deeper aspect of syntax, right? How words are ordered, you name it. You're going there and you're looking at these things. Um, you're learning the language. And especially if you are trying to study multiple languages at once and how they function, you're probably learning multiple languages. So you may end up being a polyglot, as it were, but with the goal not just of learning the languages for, hey, cool, I've learned some languages, um, which I'm not saying polyglots only do it for that reason, but you see why I'm saying that the definition of a polyglot is that you know multiple languages. Whereas for a linguist, you may or may not know multiple languages, but if you do, it's specifically for the end of studying some deeper aspect of language with like the L and in the singular, right? This kind of abstract form of language. What is language? Or at least how do certain subsets of, of human language system behave, particular languages, but it's kind of building that up, right? Right. It, it's um the thought of almost a cognitive science. It's what is language as a human behavior, as a sort of system of of utterances that the human mind creates. Uh, by the way, it doesn't have to be utterances. It could be sign. Um, and actually, increasingly these days, um, things that are on the side of language, as it were, paralinguistic, right? So things that kind of go with language in kind of the, the soup that is human communication, so gestures, um, facial expressions, other things. Uh, if you're looking at uh, kind of written aspect of language, it could also be something like, yeah, I mean, anything to do with the text itself, etc., script, you name it. Um, these are sort of paralinguistic uh, features of communication, and you could be looking at that. But it's something for the deeper, the deeper idea of what it is to use language, to um, be a speaker, to be a signer, um, etc. Um, in that sense, it's a very human science. Okay. So have we muddied the waters enough? I would say this. If you are a polyglot, you probably have a head start if you also have an interest in linguistics and vice versa. Not entirely separate. However, first thing you learn if you study linguistics is that um, people who speak many languages and linguists are not the same people. In theory, that's true. In practice, that by the way, that's also true, but it depends what kind of linguistics you do. It's really helpful for a lot of types of linguistics, especially the more you deal with real people. The more you deal with language written in books, right? Or to one language, we see the less important it is for you to know many languages. Because, like with every science, linguistics has its notation, right? It has its way of categorizing things, putting things in order, you know, you know A, B, C, X, Y, Z, you name it. So if I'm studying a certain type of verb, there's a notation for that. There's a whole field of discourse. The whole field of discourse, there's a notation. I can look up this type of verb, you know, just call them whatever, verb N. Let's just call these verbs verb N, and I want to look up these verbs. I can actually look them up if they exist, if that type of verb exists in whichever language of the world, I can probably go and increasingly there are databases for this now too, and I can probably go and look up, okay, all of these different languages spread across the world use this particular type of feature, right? This is called apology, you know, the study of type of languages, what, what features do languages have across the world? And I can do that. I probably don't need to speak actually any of these languages. But 
what am I going to be dealing with? I'm going to be dealing with other people's work that has been written down. And then my work, if I'm that person at that point, is this systematic study and this going one step deeper, right? And making big comparisons, etc. Or maybe I, I do speak a language and I deal a lot with say, oral material and I go out to the community and I speak with them. Then I note it down and then my work is now being compared with and against all of these other works that have been done by other people, right? In different languages. And then when we all come together, to talk about it, we have this notation. So that's, that's a way where you don't need to be a polyglot to be a good linguist, right? Um, yeah, many, many fantastic linguists were not polyglots. However, and many, well, and also many, many fantastic polyglots were never linguists. However, despite all of that, look, the more you know, the better, right? If you speak many, many languages and you want to look at language systematically, I can only help you. And I said speak again, but of course, it also goes for sign linguistics, right? So if you sign many of the world's sign languages, if you use them with fluency, um, which are just as systematic and as complex as spoken languages, by the way, right? big myth out there is that there's a sign language and that um you know somehow if you if you kind of create your own gestures for something you're doing sign language uh to say that's not true right uh, and languages use the hands the way you know speakers use the mouth for speaking in the sense that creates a huge system of of symbolic meaning right um an iconic meaning and you name it it creates meaning I won't go too much into those terms. We can do a separate video on sign, if you'd like. But if you are a proficient user of multiple linguistic systems, you will have an advantage in linguistics. By the way, you know, not that linguistics as, as proper, as defined by people who call themselves linguists, is the only science of language. There are many, many linguistic sciences, or language sciences, I should say. Um, but I think this video, it was perhaps helpful, I hope, to show you that it's a very complex picture, actually. What are the differences between speaking or knowing or signing or being proficient in reading multiple languages and um, study of language? And I hope I've convinced you it's quite a messy picture. There are lots of little twists and turns in, you know, in this meandering stream, perhaps stream of consciousness, you may say. Um, but it is, in fact, the case. It is, in fact, the case that they are not the same thing, speaking multiple languages and studying language. However, I hope that you've been convinced that they are intertwined. And so using multiple linguistic systems and studying the language system, phrase already sounds similar enough for a good reason. They are intertwined, and I hope that if you do to study linguistics that you do also study languages, their multiplicity, and that you keep in mind the deeper, maybe more universalizing, although it's now a dirty word, but um, the more underlying features of those languages in a systematic way. That is, uh, you see the forest and you see the trees the whole time. Have fun in the woods. Thank you very much. Off and out.